It's the eating as well, and the putting on makeup, and the personal conversations with friends and people that have. I'm always reading what's on people's laptops. I'm just really nosy, so I'm always reading what people are writing. I'd say 90% of people are slagging someone off that they work with, or talking about a social problem at work. They're never thinking about talking about work, like, I've got to do this or that. It's always gossip, and it's always politics, and I think, God, no wonder the economy is in this state. Nobody's doing their work. Everybody's in some dispute with a colleague, and that's the whole focus of their job. When everyone's drunk, it does lubricate things, and that's when you do see the nicer side of people, like when everybody's had a few drinks or it's around Christmas. Sometimes you get carriages that end up singing. There'll be some young girls who reckon themselves like X Factor or some things, and they'll start to sing, and other people will join in, and there will be a bit of a drunken sing-along. Or the train's stuck in the station, and it's come up on the board that it's been cancelled, and you've been moved to another train, and it's all crowded, everyone starts going, were you on the 6.45 last week? Oh yeah, that was terrible, wasn't it? I didn't get home till... And everyone starts exchanging their stories, and that's quite nice. So there's the good and the bad. I think our train system is a bit of an, an analogy of our society. You know, there's inequities and inconsistencies and old-fashioned divides and people being despondent and not trying to fight against issues and just going along with things and settling for second best. When I finally get home at night, I always wonder how many mites have jumped on me on the train and then jumped off in my house. They're commuters, like me. And at the weekend, all the clothes that have been on the train have to be washed on a Friday. Everything has to be cleansed of London. Then I feel my weekend begins. So that's Elizabeth. Thank you. And it's funny because um, the, the reception, uh, thankfully, has been, has been quite good. And uh, the only real negative responses I've got have been from Americans who, who have said, God, there's just so much complaining in this book. And, uh, but I feel like, you know, defending it in a way, because certainly in my 12 years in London, I've found that, that Londoners can complain in an almost operatic way that's very, that's very enjoying and, and um, helps a person you know, get through life in a sometimes hard city. So, uh, there is positive material in this book, but uh, the next section I'm going, to, I'm going to read out is one of those operatic complaints. Um, when you do this sort of work, you, um, you try and try and try and find people to, to speak to, and this book took about five years. Uh, I spoke to about 200 people, and, and 80 of them ended up in the book. So there was a lot of, there were a lot of phone calls, there was a lot of walking around, and, and sometimes it would take months to just sit down with someone, and you'd have waited and waited and waited, and within the first five minutes you'd just know that they had nothing to say or couldn't say it in an interesting way. So sometimes finding people was very hard work. I, I downloaded a list of verbs, all the verbs in English, and I then took all the verbs that I could apply to London, cutting London, cleaning London, cremating London, bewitching London, and I tried to find people who enacted those verbs. And sometimes that was a very hard process, and then sometimes someone just appeared and this man, Tim, I met at a, at, in a pub in Piccadilly one night. And I don't know if you've felt the same, but sometimes people have developed opinions about things, London being one, and they're just waiting desperately for a chance to, to tell someone. And I happened, as is often the case, to be the, the guy on the other side of the table buying the pints. So this is Tim, and he's talking about London. Now, I should make sure that it's clear that he speaks about London, which we all know, and then another kind of London, London, L-O-N-D-I-N. People sometimes ask me, oh, so where are you from? I say, oh, I'm from London. They can't hear it when you say it, but it's not the same place. It's a subtle difference, but it's very important to understand it, especially if you're not from here, especially if you're just passing through. It's a different word. 
It's like when you move here, you're introduced to this charming, attractive person, well-versed in history and up-to-date with all the music, and you decide to meet up. But when you get to the pub, their really odd twin sibling is sitting there instead. You can see the similarity, but you just think, wait a minute. What is my life like in the city of London? I get on the tube at Elephant Castle. I get off the tube at Bank and go to work. The next day I get on the tube at Elephant Castle. I get off the tube at Bank and go to work. The next day I get on the tube at Elephant Castle. I get off the tube at Bank and go to work. The next day I get on the tube at Elephant Castle. I get off the tube at Bank and go to work. I don't think I know what an elephant is anymore. I can't really summon a mental image of an elephant. I hear that word, and I just start walking towards work. I'm hated. I work in finance. I wear a collection of terrible ties. My work is constant. If I describe it in any detail, I will literally have to fall asleep. I will just have to put my head down on the table and sleep and hopefully dream of another kind of job. A job where I never once have to say the word mortgage. I'm not living in a London of big pleasures and tourism and Russian billionaires and Saatchi galleries and the London Eye, but London. I guess it's a cross between London and Londis, really. You're not exactly at Waitrose. You're not even at Sainsbury's. You're not even at Tesco's. It's a bit shit in London. But there are little pleasures, like walking very quickly and listening to my headphones. Like the taste of that ready-made pasta that they sell at M&S with chunks of feta the size of miniature golf balls. Or like the big southbound platform at Angel Station. There's so much room on that one platform. I was there the other day and I thought to myself, why did they make this platform so ridiculously big? It's wonderful. It was like I was on holiday in London. You could run up and down it, ride an animal up and down the platform, ride an elephant. Elephant, watch, I'll start walking to work. I've said the word elephant. I had a friend who used to live in South London, but she moved back to Huddersfield a couple of years ago. She called me the other night and told me she'd join a choir. I said to her, a what? She said, a choir. It was like a word beamed in from another galaxy. Why would she be in a choir when she could spend that time working? How would singing in a choir even work? Why would she even think of stepping away from her desk? I suppose I could join a choir if they held their rehearsals in the aisle of M&S where they keep their takeaway pasta meals. I could just swing by during dinner time for about three minutes before going back to my desk and then sit there and hum, but otherwise... I suppose there are choirs in London. Maybe one day they'll start one in London, the London Men's Choir. Then I had this image of me trying to sneak off to a choir rehearsal or something, something in London, sneaking towards London from London, and just about getting past this enormous sleeping beast, just like tiptoeing past. But then the elephant awakes, and then the castle awakes beside it, tag team, and the two of them block my way. You can see it, can't you? With his trunk, like, swinging down. I don't know what a, the castle would do. Can castles be aggressive? I guess they can when you play chess. I'm going to move to London someday. When I'm rich and have finally cashed out and don't have to ever, ever, ever again say that I work for a bank, I'm going to cut all my work ties into little pieces and throw them in the towns. And then I'm going to take all this money I've earned all the money people think I've earned while selling my soul, and I'm going to move from London to London. I'm going to go up to Elephant and Castle for the last time and get on the Bakerloo line and travel north. I'm going to go to Westminster Abbey and the London Eye, and when I'm in one of those pods going up to look at the city, some tourist from Munich or Idaho will say to me, oh, is this your first time in London? And I'll be all like, yep. <laughs> and you know what? London is everything I expected it to be. So, so that was Tim. Um, 
think I might pass the baton in a second here. We've got two other great readers here. And, of course, we'll be answering questions later on, so um, if there's anything pressing that you need to know, I don't really know what else to say about the book other than stressing that, yes, there are positives. But personally, I, I can't always trust someone who says that they love London outright. And we've seen a lot of, sort of blatant emotion this weekend with the, with the Jubilee. And there's something about people who just say they love, love London that I never quite believe. And I think that anyone who doesn't live on the on the fragrant level of the super rich, who actually lives in the city, has a very complicated love affair with the place. Um, and that's certainly what I found in, in doing this book, that uh, as it says in the cover, there is love, but there is on other days a lot of hate and a lot of wondering why, why one does this, why one sticks around. Um, and hopefully those voices are heard in the book. There are voices that are euphoric, that, may say some surprising things about the city. I think of the witch who, after um, producing a spell, gets rid of the remnants of her spell into the flowing river as the commuters walk past her. So the beautiful and the strange and the complainers, as we've heard, all mixed together. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more of that right now from these people. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure you agree with me. You could have sat here very happily all night long and listened to Craig tell his wonderful stories. I really um, strongly advise you to get this fantastic book. It's such a, it's, it's like a box of treasures. You can just pick it up at any point and, and read little bits. And it's, um, um, you just remind me how very humorous it is at points as well. Well, now for another fantastic uh, London book and writer, I'd like to welcome um, Sukhdev Sandhu, who we're really lucky to have. He's just flown in from New York for a few days, which is why we've uh, organised this night on this bank holiday. So I really appreciate you all coming out tonight, and, and um, I'm sure you'll be delighted that you have done. Um, Sukhdev is a film writer for the Daily T Telegraph and a former critic of the year at the British Press Awards. Um, he is also Associate Professor of English Literature at NYU, and his work has appeared in a wide range of publications. He is the author of London Calling, How Black and Asian Writers Imagined a City, I'll Get My Coat, and Night Haunts, A Journey Through the London Night, which won the 2008 D.H. Lawrence International Travel Writing Prize, and has been developed into a series of site-specific musical performances. It's a tiny, slim book, but one of the most beautifully written books about <coughs> London that I've ever come across, and a, a really extraordinary exploration of the city. So to tell us more about it, please welcome Sukhdev Sandhu. <laughs> Slightly grotty weather, but it's uh, very nice to breathe some fresh air. I don't realise that I've been breathing smog all these years living in dirty cities. Um, my my, my um, uh, books started off um, as a, uh, an online project, really, and it was commissioned by and developed with an organisation that Rachel said a number of um, projects with called Art Angel. And they've worked with people like uh, John Berger, Janet Cardiff, a ra range of artists, and their work is very broad and sort of promiscuous, it's often hard to explain, but one of the through lines of it is that it's often interested in spaces, landscapes, um, places off, off the beaten trail, um, and places rich in memory, forgotten memory, stray memories, perverse memories, places um, encrusted with, with, with um, history, and often to enjoy them, uh, the projects can't be accessed online or in book form. You have to go there. There's a kind of temporary theatre there. They, 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 they require kind of participation <coughs> from the audiences, um, and then they sort of disappear. They kind of linger on slightly uh, falteringly in, 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 in the documentation. And I suppose I've always been interested in places that are no longer are no longer there, or are remembered um, patchily or faultily, um, like 
probably many of you, and I'm, I'm a child of migrants, and so most of my life has been spent um, being told, and sometimes feeling that this, this present world in front of you is just a second-rate version of the, the true homeland or, or the real nurturing space of a sort of small, uh, rather sort of dying village in northern India. So I've been very kind of attuned to these sort of parallel um, realities as well. And, and I suppose uh, this book isn't in any way autobiographical. Uh, my, my relatives, my parents, well, when they arrived, well, they often arrived in sort of cities that had suffered um, bombing, uh, attacks of, uh, from World War, and had seen sort of better days as well. And the, the job of the migrants was to tidy them up, to kind of make them function more smoothly, more, um, 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 more better. Um, and that's something about that toil and that, that, that sort of labour and the, our kind of grayscale memories. This is something which is kind of increasingly forgotten by sort of second and sort of third generation children who've, been, who've grown up with radiators and central heating and laptop computers and for whom life for the most part seems to have gotten um, progressively better um, as well. And they're often kind of embarrassed at the stories that their parents sometimes don't, can't, can't even articulate about the struggles that they, they went through in terms of, sort of sacrificing things, in terms of living in sort of slightly um, battered sort of tenement uh, buildings in the sort of same heated up, um, in beds heated up by their cousins or their, their brothers. And so there was a sense that these kind of migrants who are often seen and described in current affairs journalism as, uh, as agents of kind of newness, breaking, breaking down Britain themselves are kind of sort of old. They themselves are fading and their stories, the landscapes they saw them, are kind of brittle and kind of faded. Um, and um, so I've always been drawn to this rather sort of woo woozy kind of nexus of issues. And I suppose this, this book, um, which initially started off as me following the footsteps of uh, a sort of best-selling writer uh, from the start of the 20th century, H. V. Morton, who wrote for the Evening Standard, and uh, the Daily Mail and a, a wide number of other magazines. Uh, a kind of uh, Bill Bryson of his day to some extent, and he's writing books about the Knights of London, the Haunts of London, the Adventures of London, as following in, in his footsteps. But uh, as, as time went on, I, I think I realised that, first of all, I didn't have his confidence. He has a very big, rather imperial, swaggering eye. He sometimes looks down on the people as much as he looks at them. Sometimes he even uses phrases like the little men or the, the little women. Sometimes what's magical about it, uh, his writing is the sense of the city as a theatre, as, as pantomime. But sometimes it seems rather kind of sort of cloying or a little bit uh, just uh, but picturesque, over, overly picturesque. So that, fa that faded away, the idea that I could just kind of replicate his journeys and certainly the places he was interested in the, the neighbourhoods sometimes they didn't exist in that fashion. I found myself increasingly using the word we, which can be equally um, sort of patronising, but I felt that I sometimes saw and spent time with over the course of three years people in all sorts of states of sorrow. But what I wasn't interested in was clubbing, nightlife, all the jamboree, the carnivalesque because of noise that nightlife suggests. So I was kind of edited that out of my imagination. I was more interested in people who work, who toil. We often, it's a kind of cliche in the modern world that um, big cities and the country itself perhaps doesn't have manufacturing or that we're in the realm of the post-industrial. Um, but I, I've always grown up with people who work with their hands who come home at, ni uh, at night and uh, on Fridays kind of smelling, smelling of labour to spend a week, as, as Craig was suggesting, kind of washing off uh, the, the, the kind of memories of work and London is full of toil and it's the toil that makes the nightlife um, possible. So, so the book became partly about work, about graft, about people who bend down for a living and people whose work is taken for granted so it becomes like a kind of x-ray of a city, uh, an attempt to hang around with people who are regarded as invisible. Now, they themselves are watching, they themselves are really beady-eyed. Sometimes 
and taking uh, pictures. Sometimes they're aware of the cameras kind of all around them, but they're also taking kind of pictures too. Um, and it's a book about touch. Um, it's about the texture of the city. Um, online especially, I was, I was kind of interested, and it's often been performed in a kind of musical setting, and it's very attuned to, to the sound of London, or the sound of any place really. If you close your eyes, can you evoke a place? And what are, what are the, the, the kind of the sound marks um, of, 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 a, of, a, of any place as well? And so the question I kept asking myself is, so what am I trying to do when I'm writing? Am I creating a kind of lullaby? Is it a kind of prayer? Is it a valentine? Is it a confessional? Is, is it the kind of sound of a kind of screaming nightmare? And I was kind of interested in the sound of people talking as much as, as what, they, um, what they said. And I was interested in, in, in memory as well. The city is changing fast, like lots of places. Uh, the buildings are made of different materials from how they were being built 30 years ago or 100 years ago. So they soak up sound. In, in different ways. Uh, there's more traffic than there used to be decades before, so the night is less, is, is less quiet. Um, sound, sound moves in all sorts of ways, and now people at night time are paying bills and talking to people in Bangalore. They're paying off bills on their laptops. Uh, the radiator is sputtering. Uh, the walls seem to be thinner. They're sharing space. Um, with, with people and we can hear their snoring, we can hear their apnea um, constantly. But, but, but the night has not a place just of rest, of quiet, of sleep after the kind of maddening day, but it's a place of its own kind of chatter. That's something um, I was quite um, into. And so um, I was interested yeah, in capturing that and also touch. Um, I spent a lot of time with kind of graffiti writers who were constantly being um, chased by um, police. I got arrested outside. Stupidly, I went out with some fly poster um, guys and uh, we went to a Danish embassy and we'd kind of forgotten that just that day there was kind of, sort of scandal about cartoonists who some of them supposedly anti Islam uh, cartoons. There was fear that the Danish embassy would be attacked. We completely forgot this and we were posting, it may well have been Jimmy Carr posters um, around town, uh, and then we got caught and we were uh, carted off to the police, um, uh, police cells. And, um, and actually, truthfully though, um, I was just really nosy. Um, I wanted to go to places um, that I'd always, they, I'd heard whispers about, rumours about. Somebody had once told me about nuns somewhere near Hyde Park who spent all their time, uh, all the night, praying for London. That seems such an odd idea. All the night? Praying for London? Um, and they do exist, the nuns of Tyburn. Um, and I often used to wonder about the, why I was being kept uh, awake at night by the helicopters. Um, who again use their kind of rotating blades um, partly to clear the streets. They're not actually following anybody or tracking uh, anybody, but the noise acts as they think as a kind of a deterrent. Their, their ability to kind of zoom in on people. They showed me how you can almost make out a kind of Lacoste label from thousands of feet in the, in the, um, in the sky. Um, and again, how wonderful to be able to get kind of access um, to that or being woken up by an uh, urban fox hunter who says, be with me at this golf course near, uh, uh, near uh, where was it, near Hounslow, um, in an hour's time at three o'clock in the morning, and as soon as I get, I get there, he says, jump on this, so we start jumping on, uh, on the rabbit's guts, that, uh, he, did, he brought a bag of rabbits uh, with him, and his feet are stinking, so rabbits, and then you use them as bait for these foxes. Um, as well, and again, at one level, you know, you're really groggy. At another level, you stink for ages. In another way, it's slightly kind of embarrassing when they're kind of dancing around uh, with the dead foxes later. But on the other hand, um, what larks? Um, what, 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 what adventures? And I normally lead a very boring life. And so uh, there is that sense of kind of becoming a tourist within a place that you think you know. Now, there's a way of describing that which is very negative, which is a kind of slumming. And so that's always the risk. Um, but you hope by the way you write, um, by the stories that you hear, by the com uh, questions that you ask, that it doesn't just become a, a kind of picturesque spectacle, that it doesn't become callous, um, but that it is you know, a kind of collaboration and that collective... I'm always drawn to kind of short books and short stories. Um, 
I, li I like sort of finding old diaries. I like finding <coughs> chits, love letters, stuff left over in ki uh, phone kiosks or in internet cafes, and sometimes a kind of fragment, but, you know, as a kind of museum, museologists know, kind of a fragment of a statue can be as poignant or as evocative as, as, as the whole thing. Your, your mind, your imagination does, does the rest of the work. And so I was hoping that the book, which is a kind of anthology, I suppose, of different kinds of journeys, different kinds of drifts, in, in a company of uh, labourers, some of them fun, uh, kind of graffiti writers, exorcists, who spend the days touching buildings, touching railings, because uh, they, they, they believe that evil can first be discerned by a smell, and then conquered um, uh, uh, later on in the night. And certainly all my recording equipment disappeared that night. Um, so I, th I think that was Fentus um, getting his revenge um, on us. Um, so I'll read a little extract. I don't know exactly if it's kind of re representative. Um, so as I say, the voice changes in each chapter as well. There's a kind of, um, there's not a stable self. And sometimes I'm more visible in chapters, sometimes I kind of disappear. And maybe that's the experience of life in big cities. Your friends, sometimes your kind of relatives, they're there for big chunks of your life. And sometimes it's just stuff happens, they disappear, they're, they're busy. And then they kind of, you, you, you see them on the other side of the platform or on the other side of the street, or somebody who looks like them as well. That, that sense of the, the random, um, the uh, odd juxtapositions, odd encounters, I was trying to kind of render. In, in, in the form of the book itself. So one of the chapters was um, about cleaners, um, um, night cleaners, and um, you know, they talk about um, themselves um, as you know, part of the kind of the invisible economy. They talk about the city as a kind of page and their job is to, to make it white overnight, to kind of clear it all, all the stubs and the placards and all, all the dirt. And then of course, come five or six o'clock in the morning, the uproar begins again, the commuters begin, and then it gets all very dirty. They talk about their pride in their job, about how they go behind every kind of potted plant or behind this and that bottle. They may not be paid very much, they may be sometimes sort of shoved into. Sometimes their job is horrible, you know, they talk about kind of clearing up uh, the kind of the bloody drags um, of of children who've been kind of, sort of thrown out of buildings, or they talk about finding homeless people living in skips. Um, and so, you know, again, just one example of, they, they see the parts of London that we don't wish to see, and sometimes in a kind of X-factor uh, TV landscape, it seems uh, hard to, uh, it's not very visible even on, the, on TV as much as it perhaps um, used to. London's, London, sorry, London's cleaners don't exist. Those sleeping take their work for granted. Even those who do not see, see them scuttling across roads in their overalls and starchy, non-flammable uniforms tend to look straight through them. Nighttime is all about glamour these days, its promise and its most heady realisation. But there's nothing glamorous about cleaners. They may as well be dead. They certainly appear to be only half alive. In they creak, pushing distractedly at the revolving doors of a sleek, corporate towers where they labour. They're sweat glazed from rushing across town. Some have had to cut the last few minutes of their evening law classes in order to clock on promptly. Others have come from laundrette or corner store jobs. Others have been on the phone for hours, desperately trying to get someone to look after their sick kids for them. They're tired by the time they arrive. By the time they finish, they're utterly spent. London's cleaners don't exist. Some, employed by violently penny-pinching sub-subcontractors, sub are illegal migrants whose names are not to be found on any official financial records. They have no recourse to the law if parts of their salaries are randomly docked, or if they get hurt because of shoddy safety equipment, or if they're sexually harassed. So they keep their heads down, their lips tightly shut. Always even though they're doing jobs no one else wants, lifting up to 750 bins on each floor, they feel as if they are interlopers. Those filing into the HSBC building near Canary Wharf have their bags checked as they go in and as they leave. 
Their movements are tracked and monitored by banks of cameras which are operated by a control centre in the basement. Late working office staff do not look at them though. In shared lifts, they appear at their feet or suddenly feel an urge to start blackberrying colleagues. But night time, even in air-conditioned corporate spaces, brings them into unexpected contact with the kinds of civilians their work insulates them from during daytime. They feel tarnished, a little afraid, awkward. Some, the cleaners are convinced, regard them as no better than the rubbish they pick up or hoover. They rarely smile or say hello, or seem to have any inkling that the green dungreed men and women beside them were once small businessmen themselves. Aspiring politicians chased out of their home countries by bloodlusting guerrillas, junior school teachers who taught orphaned children to read books. The cleaners themselves, though, do look around, even more slyly than the cameras tailing them. The younger ones comb the open plan offices for desks, under which, much to the annoyance of their supervisors, they can squat and yellow highlight passages from structural engineering textbooks. Others peer at the photographs that line the walls and show what the building looked like at different stages of the construction process. <coughs> they wonder, do the CEOs here, those who earned £2,700 rather than £5 an hour, those who are driven in by chauffeurs rather than slash-seated public transport, those who have win vintage wines and DVDs in their offices and who will receive golden handshakes when they leave. Do these captains of industry regard us as part of that process? Will anyone commemorate the work we do? We, the pensionless ones? We, who are not even entitled to sick pay? And then, sometimes, as dawn is rising, the cleaners take a break from crumb picking and mouse trap shifting. Their night's work is almost over. The offices are as clean as the hills and golf courses of the foreign kingdoms to which they dream of migrating. They stand up tall, proud of the reformations they have wrought. Just for a minute or two, they allow themselves the luxury of imagining that they are the shirt tucked chauffeur-driven masters of the universe who lord it over the snooty pen-pushers and keyboard-dabbers whose garbage they've spent the last seven hours collecting. Clear out your desks and leave, they fantasise, declaring. They wander over to the windows. Light is flooding in now, and they feel their spirits rise. They crack a few jokes, whip out their flashy mobile phones. Hey, Mr Nana from Ghana, say cheese, and take snaps of each other. Then they look out over the strange multinational island outside, the helipads, the Millennium Dome, the River Thames speckled with private boats, the top of Canary Wharf. They know it's a republic in which they work, but do not live. They know they are but temporary guests. Still, for a moment or two, they are struck by the hard lunar beauty of it all. There, in the distance, is what's left of last night's full moon. It reminds them of nights long ago, thousands of miles away. Nights when they kissed their lovers and made solemn promises to always be true. Nights when they looked up at and vowed that life would one day be different. They focus their viewfinders and take a photo of a bridge on the horizon. Where does it go? It's a question that nags them all day.